Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Knitting Annie podcast, episode three. I am your host, Knitting Annie. You'll find me as Knitting Annie on Instagram and on my YouTube channel and on my website, knittingannie.com. Thank you for joining me. This is my third episode. It's Sunday, January 11th, and I'm really happy to be here with you guys. If you are a returning viewer, thank you so much. And if this is your first time watching, thank you. I hope that you enjoy watching and welcome. So I have a lot to show you this week. Not a lot of it is finished knitting, unfortunately. I hurt my hands last week with my marathon knitting sessions and I stopped knitting on Tuesday thinking that if I let myself rest, I'd be okay by Friday and that was not the case. So my hands are killing me, my wrists really hurt and it really hurts like in this part, <laughs> lots and lots of tension. It really hurts in this part of my thumb. I think it's kind of like a carpal tunnel pain, but then I tried to do this beginner yoga thing that I downloaded on my phone and even just putting pressure on my wrists when I prop myself up really hurts too. So I'm kind of depressed. Um, I'm gonna have to take a longer break from knitting, which means I'll have to do some other things. I think spinning would also hurt me. So I'm going to, in the meantime, try and organize my fiber stash and go through all my stuff to see what I can do that's still fiber related and that doesn't hurt my wrists. Do you guys have that kind of a problem? I know that some people that I watch knit like hours every night and then seem to be fine and keep going and it's not a problem. And it makes me feel like, man, there must be something wrong with me that my wrists are so sensitive or that my fingers are so sensitive. So I don't know if anybody else has any tips or tricks or whatever, I'm open to hearing it. I've tried resting, I've tried um, doing stretches in between knitting, I'll knit for 15 minutes then I'll stop for 15 minutes, but no matter what I try, it seems to be the same. I've also tried changing up how tight I hold things when I knit, and I've tried gripping the needles looser, but it is what it is. So, my sock head hat has not really come along all that far. One thing I do want to say, my aunt, my Aunt Tony, who is probably not watching this, but she might one day if she ever finds out that I'm doing it, um, gave me these cute little Christmas ornaments, and she gave them to me in this Victoria's Secret bag, which she repurposed, I'm sure. And whatever was in here, and she gave me the name of the perfume, but I'm gonna have to look it up again, is like the best smelling thing I've ever smelled. So, my knitting smells like that perfume. <laughs> I'll show you how far along I got. That's it. So obviously the ribbing is done, and I've done, oh gosh, how many inches is that? five or so inches in the stockinette. Isn't this yarn so great though? This is part of the reason why I'm so sad. I really wanted to finish this, but look how that's knitting up. I just love the pops of green and then the little bits of turquoise that are in there too. It's really sparkly. And like I said in the last episodes, this is from Yarn Ink. I just wanted to let you know though, because a couple people have said, wow, where can I get that? This was, I think, an accidental dye job for her. So she said she can't reproduce it, um, but I'm sure that all of her yarns are very lovely. The, the yarn itself is very squishy and bouncy and super sparkly, and I really love it. And I can't wait to be able to knit it again. So sad. In other kind of sad fiber news, and I don't mean to start out by being a Debbie Downer, <laughs> I hired somebody from Etsy to be the graphic designer for my blog. As fancy as that sounds, it wasn't that serious. I'm running um, my domain using TypePad. So it's very easy to customize TypePad. It's just a, another blogging platform like WordPress or Blogger or whatever. I don't even know what's out there anymore. So it's fairly easy. So I found this chick on Etsy to make this design for me. I wanted it to be super simple, no big deal. She didn't have to make an elaborate graphic design. And unfortunately, I've been kind of taken to town. So I pay her this money and I'm expecting the blog to be finished and it should have been finished actually before Christmas, way back in the second week of November. 
And now I'm finding myself fighting for my money back, which has been a bit of a challenge too, so I don't have that yet. So part of my fiber week was kind of depressing. I couldn't knit, and then I said I wanted to blog every day of the week, and I stopped that, I wanna say Tuesday or Wednesday, I can't remember. Part of the reason, because I wasn't feeling so hot, I'd get home from work and just wanna to go to sleep and be cozy. Um, but the other reason, because I was so disheartened, because I'm battling this woman to get my money back. Anyway, I don't have that many bad experiences to talk about in the fiber world, which is really good. And I've been on Etsy since 2007, and this has been my first experience like this one. So I hope that I'm able to get my money back. All right, so enough with the sad stuff. I will show you some things that I finished in the past, which I'd like to show off. <laughs> and I'll show you um, something that came in the mail recently that I bought with my friend um, Susan, who has a local yarn store in Monticello, New York, and I'll tell you more about her later. And I'll show you some fibery things, things I plan on spinning. I'm looking over. My great wheel here has this kind of base that I like to keep everything on when I'm talking to you guys so I can grab it really easy. So that's what I'm doing. I'm looking over and checking. So I'll show you some of those things. And I guess we will start with my friend Susan and the things that I got from her shop. So Susan owns a brick and mortar yarn store in Monticello, New York. It's going to be moving um, some point soon. She is so great. I met her when Brad and I were living out there. We had a little kind of like farm thing going on with our own animals and stuff. But I met Susan when I went in there to buy some yarn and we became friends. Susan has a tremendous selection of yarn. There's um, just a couple brands that she doesn't carry. So the majority of the yarn you can think of, she's got. She's got a website, and I'm looking at my notes so I don't say anything wrong. It's k1n2.com, which stands for her store, uh, Knit One Needlepoint Two. So if you are somebody that does needlepoint, Susan also has a really vast selection of that kind of stuff too. And she doesn't really make a big stink of it or advertise it a lot, but she has an amazing discount code that is posted on her website. You can get 15% off your purchase, which is huge, especially if you're doing a really big project. And um, free shipping in the US on items or purchases $25 or greater. So I hope you guys check her out. I just bought a few things with her that I'm gonna show you. I'm really excited about it. If I can knit anytime soon, I will take these out and break them in. I'm really looking forward to that. I got an Click Lace Turbo set. In this set, I have multiple needles and multiple cords of different lengths, and I am super stoked about this. Do you guys have any um, interchangeable sets? And if so, do you use this set, or what do you use and what do you like? I won't take it out and bore you with that kind of stuff, but you can see that's a picture of what it looks like and all the different needles it comes with. And then I got some other Addies to supplement the size and length of things that aren't in here. And a skein of yarn. See how sparkly it is? Isn't that awesome? This is Kramer Yarns Fountain Hill Brushed Mohair. And this is acrylic and mohair. I don't do acrylic a whole heck of a lot, like I said in one of the last shows. But when I do, I like it with something like this. Isn't that so pretty? It's really soft and fluffy. Um, it's got, how many yards? 100 grams, approximately 560 yards. So that is plenty of yarn. I'm not quite sure what I'm gonna make with it. I think maybe another Bedford Spring shawl. We'll see. Now that I'm looking at this in this light, it kind of looks like it has both silver and gold sparkle. That's pretty cool. So that's that. Thank you, Susan. Next, oh, I went to Stitches East. Um, I don't know how many stitches there are. There's a Stitches West. Is there a Stitches Central? <laughs> I 
I don't know, but they have Stitches East and it's not very far from me. Um, it's in Connecticut, it's in Hartford. And it's this huge convention center and it's set up as far as the eye can see with vendors that are selling knitting things, um, fibery things, yarn, webs hosts it. And you can get anything from finished knit garments to knitting machines to spinning fiber, just everything is there. And I went um, this past year for the first time and Brad was very patient, he went along with me. Part of me really wants to find a knitting friend here in this state so I can go to knitting things with them instead of taking my poor husband along. He is a very good sport about it and he sometimes helps me <laughs> pick out yarns and look through things. Other times he likes to sit down and relax and read a book. But thank you Brad for coming with me. These are a couple really pretty bobbins that I picked up. I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do with them. They're made by Luchi Yarn or Lucky Yarn, L-U-C-C-I. They're both polyester. The blue one is 100 yards and the silver taupe one is 200 yards. And if I can put that close, I don't know how well you can see that. It's a thread and then it's got this teeny, teeny, tiny little sequins on it. So cool. But I think it would be smart held together with something else and then maybe knit along the edge of a shawl or maybe if there's a lace pattern at the bottom of a shawl, I can put that in there. I'm not quite sure what um, color yarn I would use with that. Maybe something very neutral? I don't know. And then this one is a very bright, like peacocky turquoise blue. And it's got some threads of gold and copper mixed in. And then the sequins are bigger and they have kind of like a holographic shimmer to them. Oh, I love sparkles. Look at that all glittery. If you have any idea of what I can do with this stuff to maximize it, let me know. Watson is barking. Come here, Watson. You cannot bark. We are filming the podcast. Thank you. We'll see how long that lasts. <laughs> Next is some fiber that I got at Stitches East. For the life of me, I cannot remember who this vendor was. She's from Maine. She was there with her husband. They had a booth. They were very nice. And if I can figure out who she was, I might have put it on my Instagram. I'll link to her in the show notes. But I bought three braids of this. This is a merino with silk. It is so soft, I cannot even describe it to you. And it's got this pretty sheen from the silk in there. It's not sparkly, it's just kind of shiny. And I made one skein already. You can almost see, just from how the skein looks, how the drape of this is. I don't really know what I'm gonna do with it. It's a little bit thicker than I normally spin, which is good because I think the longer you spin, um, the thinner your yarn ends up being. Um, I remember when I first started spinning, my ultimate goal was to spin this super fine yarn, and I don't really know why. I think you see other people do it, and you're like, wow, that's a challenge, I need to learn how to do it. I don't know. But this is a close-up of the yarn. I don't think you're seeing the accurate, accurate color. It's a little bit darker in person. So I have this one and one more to spin. I'm gonna try and spin it the same thickness as this and then see how many yards I get and figure out what to, go, what to do from there. Oh, and I have on today, I showed you this last time. This is the um, Miss Winkle that I made out of my own hand spun yarn. And my mother-in-law, hi, who is watching my podcast now for the first time, um, said she had seen me show this, but she didn't really know how I wore it, so she didn't get a good idea of what it was. So it's kind of like, I don't know if you want to call it a short shawl or a oddly shaped scarf, but I just wrap it around a couple times. I like it so you can see the loops and that the tail that doesn't have the loops is kind of tucked in or not the main focus. And I just kind of do that. So this is Miss Winkle. It's a really great project if you are driving or you want something that doesn't require a lot of brain power. The next thing um, is something that I made 
I want to say two years ago, and the first time I wore it was at um, the Connecticut Sheep and Wool Festival, which again is something that if you're in this area or if you're in New England or if you want to drive up and visit something, it's so awesome. Um, that is the Connecticut Sheep and Wool Festival is a lot more um, fiber producers and things like that. It's not as much finished stuff. If you are a spinner, it's definitely the show to go to. Whereas I find that like stitches is more so for knitters, but they both have, you know, stuff for everybody there. It's also really great to bring kids to because there's some live animals, there's some demonstrations. So if you are in Connecticut, I think the one this year is April 25th. I'm not quite sure, but I'm definitely going to that. Um, but anyway, I wore this to that show and so many people there were like, wow, that's really pretty. And it made me feel really good because they are fiber people. And for them to say something was nice, it was like, yeah, oh, thanks, I made that. But this is a shawl. It is by a designer called Through the Loops, which is probably how you know her. She's on Ravelry. Um, I think she's on Instagram too, I can't remember. Her name is Kirsten Kapoor, and this is called Thalia. And I'll put it closer so you can see the detail. It's a shawl. And that's the top portion. A lot of this is double yarn overs, which I hadn't done until this pattern. And then the bottom lace portion, so pretty. And then the edging, <laughs> the edging is a crochet bind off, which was kind of interesting to block. I don't really have blocking that, so I kind of make this elaborate setup with towels and newspaper and then I use these pins on the floor. I need to get some play mats and properly block stuff that way. What can I say about this? I was a little bit nervous when I started to read the pattern because it was a little bit more difficult than I am accustomed to. I'm also not a chart reader. I really prefer things written and this was written. Um, and I hadn't done double yarn overs before so I I was a little bit nervous, but I watched some videos on YouTube, which I encourage everybody to do. If you're not sure about a stitch in a pattern and that's what's keeping you from doing it, just go on YouTube and figure it out because really this wasn't very difficult to do and it looks like it was a lot more difficult. I don't remember what the yarn was that I used. It's a thin, it's probably a thin sock weight. Um, I want to say it was El Rey. I can't remember. And I think I got both of these yarns from Susan. And the way I like to wear this, I generally don't wear it as a shawl, but I'm sure I could. But I just like what I have on, I just kind of put it like that and twist it around and kind of make it messy like this. You don't really see the lace pattern that way, like the, the opening stuff here. But I love it. I also wanted to show you something that I made. This had no pattern. I spun up three different colors. Yeah, three. Three different colors of Romney wool. Um, like I'd said in another episode, Romney can sometimes be a little bit more coarse, more intended for outerwear. And this was not dyed. I processed this from raw fleece. And that is the natural color of the sheep. It's so warm. When you put this over your shoulders, it's like you're instantly toasty. So I like to put this on when we're watching television and sometimes I'll grab Brad and put this around him, which kind of makes him a little bit embarrassed to be wearing a shawl, but <laughs> it's comfortable and it's warm and it's super cozy and I love it. This kind of looks like Age of Brass and Steam. I think that's what that pattern is called. It's not though, I didn't follow a pattern. I just did like a generic, shawl shape and I alternated with stockinette and garter stitch and then on some rows I did a yarn over. I don't remember but I like the way it came out and I love making things out of something that I spun 
especially when I've processed it from raw sheep fleece because then it's extra special to me. So that's that. And I'll show you something else I made, which kind of makes me laugh because I didn't use a pattern and I really have no idea how big a baby's head is. So I made this with the intention of making a owl hat for a baby. Maybe it was for my niece when she was born, I can't remember. But it's definitely not that large. It is really cute though. Isn't that so cute? It's made with an acrylic yarn. For somebody that says they don't use acrylic yarn, I'm showing you things that have acrylic in there. And I made these ear flaps and then I attached them in the round and I did some stockinette and then when I felt that the head should crown, I stitched some stitches together. And then I, I guess I cast it off by stitching them together. Yeah, because it's a line there. And I tied some little, I don't know what you call that, fringy pieces here. <laughs> and I did a small eye cord here, and then I braided it. And the little eyes are crochet, and the little nose was also crochet, and then I kind of stitched it on there. But who is this gonna fit? Would this fit a newborn? <laughs> so I don't know what I'm going to do with it. I think I'm just going to hang on to it. Maybe eventually if I give somebody a doll, I can put it on the doll. Or if we ever have kids, I can see if this would actually fit a newborn baby. I don't know. And what else did I want to show you guys? I am working on so many things, the fibery, and one day I'll show you a picture of like my fiber stash room and where I keep all of my raw fleece. Um, but I bought this full fleece at the Connecticut Sheep and Wool Festival last year, and it is a border lester cross of some sort. I don't remember what she had it crossed with, but it's the coolest color. It's this like gray color and the tips are this kind of off-white, golden. I just fell in love with the fleece when I saw it. I think I bought three fleeces from her, but this one was particularly heavy, and it's got a really great staple length. And I knew I wanted to process it by hand. Sometimes when you go to mills, or maybe it's all the time when you go to mills, they want a maximum staple length because if it's too long, it doesn't work through their machines properly. I think this would still work if I had it made into roving, but I've been processing it myself. This is washed. When I first got it, it was a lot darker, and then once I washed out all of that lanolin that was in there and the dirt, it became this color. And I'm sure this would have been great too if I wanted to lock spin something. So if I wanted to make a yarn where these were fairly intact, and then the little curly tips would hang off, that would have been really pretty. And then you would have seen the variation in color between the darker gray bottom and the golden tip. But instead, um, what I've been doing is running this through my picker. And a picker, for those of you who are, you know, not familiar with them, you can have a couple different kinds. The one I have is a swing arm picker, and I bought it pre-owned from a lady on Craigslist who has the most amazing loom collection. It's really cool to see all these different fiber people that you can find in the world and how the different people have different obsessions. So I really love collecting raw fleeces and processing them. She really loves doing loom stuff and she had like six looms. It was amazing. Um, anyway, so I got this picker from her and it's a swing arm picker. It's fairly dangerous. It's got these um, very, very, very sharp nails on the bottom and then on the arm there are sharp nails and you put the fleece in the middle and you put the arm back and forth and the nails kind of rub against each other and separates the locks. So you can pick by hand, like if I wanted to pick this, I would do this and separate all the fibers from one another until I was left with this handful of fluff. So that is now pretty much picked. 
But see how tedious that is and how long that took me to do? So with my picker, I just grab a small handful like that and I put it in the machine and I go back and forth and it opens it up and I don't have to do that by hand. It's so much quicker and so much easier. You just have to be really careful because those nails are super sharp and they will get you. So once I have that, I take the picked fiber and I put that into my drum carter, which then further aligns everything and puts everything into a bat. And I'm doing that, that's the drum carter motion because it's a, a barrel and it's got a crank on it and it's got very fine um, metal cloth on it, which kind of looks like dog slicker brushes and the barrels roll and it makes a bat, which is this. I am like three quarters of the way through making the bats for the fleece. I still have about 25% of it that I have to pick and then I'll try and do these bats. But I just unrolled that bat. I like to roll them up for storage. And that's pretty much what it looks like. And it's so soft and fluffy. And the fibers, you know, pretty much go in the same direction. You can see how nice that turned out. The fleece is awesome. It didn't have a lot of vegetable matter in it, which spinners call VM, which makes sense. Um, so I'm not really picking out a lot of little pieces of seed or hay or anything like that. And I'm not getting a lot of nips because the fiber itself is very strong. Um, sometimes with the finer fleeces like Merino or Cormo, you don't want to have that much processing done because the fiber can start to break. So sometimes the tips are a little bit fragile um, or the fiber itself is a little bit fragile. Maybe I shouldn't say fragile for the fiber. It definitely requires more delicate processing though um, because if you don't do it delicately and you do the picking and then you run it through your carter, it makes these little tiny wool balls in there called nips. And I'll see if I can show you one or two in here. But there's one right there and it's just maybe a short bit from where it was, um, maybe a second cut that was in the fleece or maybe there was something that broke But see that little ball there? You'd get a lot more of that in a finer fleece. And this is a little bit stronger, so I'm not worried about how I process it this way. You know, if I was, I would be using my combs, um, which are something else entirely. And I'm very fortunate to have the collection that I do. I've been collecting fiber processing tools all along, and it's been a big help. But I do have dog slicker brushes too. I use them as like a packer brush on my carter or sometimes if I'm just breaking up something to spin a lock um, without processing it I'll grab my dog brush and I'll just kind of like flick the ends on it and open it up that way but isn't that so pretty I haven't yet decided um, what I would do with the spun fiber but it would be a challenge for me to make sure I don't spin this too thin um, also to make sure with this great amount of fiber that I'm making the yarn consistent size all the way through so that's that. Well, I think that's pretty much it for today, guys. Um, I wish I had more whips to show you or I could talk about the knitting I had done last week, but that unfortunately didn't happen. Thank you so much for watching. Um, please let me know if there's anything that you would like me to touch on or talk about or any questions you might have. Or if you like seeing something spun or seeing a certain thing knit a certain way, let me know and I'll see if I can do that for you while you're watching. At some point I really want to show you guys how I knit with curly locks. So you can try that at home. You don't have to be a fiber processor, you don't have to be a spinner, but there is a way you can take these really curly fibers and there's much fleece that's much curlier than this, but you can get this and knit this right into your garment and you don't have to spin it into yarn. So hopefully I'll show you that in a later episode. Um, but thank you, thank you for watching, thank you for your support. And I'm going to try and make my website a little bit more fancy and post some more things. And I'll put a link on there. My mother-in-law was telling me as well that it was hard for her to figure out how to subscribe. So you can go to my YouTube channel, which is called Knitting Annie. If you have a YouTube app, I find that it's super easy to use. 
and you can follow people very easily on there. Um, I think I have like 23 subscribers right now, which is kind of crazy and cool at the same time. But I'll put a link on the website as to how you can subscribe on YouTube. And that's pretty much it. Thank you for watching. I'm really happy to be doing this and I'm happy to spend some time with you. Thanks. Bye.